It's a great, great pleasure now to introduce our next speaker, Alice Rothorn. Alice is the design critic of the International Herald Tribune. Her weekly design column is published every Monday. It's one of the great rituals for me every Monday to start the week with Alice's extraordinary column. Alice is a trustee of the Arts Council England and the Whitechapel Gallery in London, and she is chair of the Board of Trustees of the Chisholm Hale Gallery. Her next book, Hello World, Where Design Meets Life, explores the changing role of design in our lives and will be published by Hamish Hamilton in March 2013. Alice is an advisor to this year's marathon and also to many previous marathons. The presence of design is essential for the marathons and Alice's expertise in the many fields of design plays such an invaluable part for these marathon events. Last year, Alice interviewed landscape architect Adrian Goese, urban design practice Something in Sun and artist Field Club to talk about innovative design ideas in the garden. This year, Alice will present a talk about design and memory. A very, very warm welcome to Alice Rothon. Well, as you may have guessed, I paid Hans Ulrich to say all those lovely things about me. Um, and as he has explained, I'm here to talk about design and memory, specifically about the role played by design in forming our memories and how it's likely to redefine them in the future. Now, design is intrinsic to the formation of memory for the simple reason that it's one of the most powerful forces in determining the course of our lives. What we do, where we go, whether we succeed or fail when we get there, how we feel about it, and, whether we, and how we remember it. But when I told a friend yesterday that I was going to give this talk, she told me very tersely that she had no idea what design really was, so I couldn't possibly pretend to talk about design in anything, memory or anything else, without defining it, so I'm going to give it a go. Now, design is a very slippery and elusive phenomenon that means many different things to different people and has changed dramatically over time. It has adopted different guises, meanings and objectives in different contexts, and it's been muddled, marginalized, and misinterpreted along the way. But its elemental role has always remained the same. It's an agent of change, and it helps us to make sense of changes around us, whether they're political, scientific, social, cultural, technological, or economic, and hopefully to turn them to our advantage. We engage with design every time we change our behavior or our surroundings, whether we do so instinctively, like the farmer who built this wall, there you go, there's the wall. Or strategically, like, say, the Apple design team, which is why we can't avoid design even if we wish to. And one area of our lives where design is having a particularly dramatic effect now is in their material contents. The familiar things, the objects that we see around us and use every day are changing, as you all know, thanks to digital technology they already have, with new ones emerging to forge new memories and others disappearing to exist only in old memories. So I thought it would be interesting to look at what's likely to stay, what will go, and why. Historically, the last period at which this kind of change in material culture happened at a similar speed and on a similar scale was at the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries, when electricity became accessible to millions of people. And electrical contraptions were invented to replace traditional objects, as say electrical lighting, did candles and gaslight. Now, it's Strange to think of it now, but electrification seemed so exciting at the time that a group of artists in Paris, led by Robert and Sonia Delaunay, would race around the city to cheer whenever electric lights were switched on in particular streets for the first time. They were absolutely convinced that electricity would forge a better future, so they wanted to celebrate it. Now, I've yet to hear of any digital idealists roaming the countryside to cheer whenever new cell towers open or server centers, but their promise is exactly the same. Digitization has already had at least as dramatic an impact on our lives as electrification did a century ago and will continue to do so at an accelerating race. 
And the catalyst is the transistor. Generations of scientists have striven first to invent it at Bell Labs in New Jersey in the late 1940s as a means of storing data and then to make it smaller. So successful have they been that several million transistors can now be squeezed onto a tiny microchip, which would have contained no more than a handful when it was introduced in the late 1950s. And as a result, this labyrinth of boxes and wires, this is IBM's first stored memory computer, the 701, that it introduced in 1952. Now it's current equivalent is this, the iPad, obviously much smaller and much, much, much more powerful. And something as tiny as this, this is my iPhone, in case it's so small you can't see it, not only packs more computing power than a great big bulldozer, but fulfills the function of countless other objects too. A phone, a camera, an internet browser, a games console, a DVD player, a sound system, a watch, a clock, a diary, newspapers, magazines, books, a calculator, an atlas, and so on and so on, plus all the weird and wonderful things that apps can do. So in principle, we don't actually need any of those other things, and a lot of you will have forsaken them already, but other people like me are at a kind of intermediary stage in this relationship between design and technology because we cling on to some of them, largely because our memories make us feel too fond of them to let them go. So take my watch, I still wear one, rather a large one, even though I don't need to, because I can always tell the time, probably more accurately on my phone. But I wear it because I've persuaded myself that I like it. And the more I think about it, that's really because of the memories it evokes. I don't want to part with my watch, because I have memories of wearing them in the past, being given my first watch as a little girl, and then a more expensive one when my parents foolishly thought I was grown up enough to look after it. But if I was 20 years younger, I wouldn't have those memories and may well consider a watch to be superfluous. The same applies to a printed newspaper, the one I write for, and the one I read first thing every morning. Even though I read most of its contents on our website and other newspapers' websites the day before. Those sites beat a printed paper in so many ways. They're constantly updated, they offer instant access to their archives and other websites, and I don't have to worry about the environmental implications of toxic ink, fell trees, and disposing of it all. I've continued to read that newspaper every morning for nostalgic reasons, because my memories of it, of the ritual, seem so special just as I wear the watch. But soon I'll forsake them, as will my peers. There'll be fewer and fewer people with similar memories to replace us, and the economics of producing those things will implode, which is why they and so many other digitally imperiled objects are in danger. Their only hope of reprieve is to continue to offer us something so special that we'll fight for them, and that means not just memories like the watch or the newspaper. Now, some objects will survive because design engineering makes them functionally superior to their digital equivalents. One day, we may be able to take photographs on our phones that are as good as those from sophisticated cameras. But until we can, anyone who's seriously interested in photography will continue to use a traditional camera. But any object without that functional advantage is at risk. Take the pocket calculator like this one. Mine is actually dead, but I'm so fond of it, it's still in my desk, which is, of course, completely ridiculous. So if you think of a pocket calculator, it's unbelievable now to think that when it was first introduced in the early 70s, it seemed dazzlingly seductive, because it was the closest most people came to a computer. They were still enormous, if a little smaller than IBM's 701. They were locked in air-conditioned rooms, and only trained technicians were allowed to operate them. Even in 1981, the pocket calculator was still deemed so cool that Kraftwerk dedicated an album track to it. I'm adding and subtracting, I'm controlling and composing around the lyrics without an ounce of irony. So, but who needs one of these slabs of plastic now that the calculator on a phone adds and subtracts just as accurately and the same phone does so much else too? So what will make an endangered object special enough to survive? The answer is an ephemeral quality or bundle of qualities that give it an emotional impact in its current guise over and above its nostalgia value.
Charles Darwin described this phenomenon in his 1871 book, The Descent of Man, by explaining why some animals have features whose sole purpose appears to be aesthetic rather than functional, but whose desirability actually has a practical agenda. An example is the peacock whose splendid tail is intended to seduce peahens and thereby propagate the species. And a similar process will determine which traditional objects survive in the digital age. Desirability won't be sufficient in itself, no matter how beautiful or sensual an object is. These brown calculators are dazzling examples of 20th century industrial design. They were designed by Dieter Rams and Dieter Lubbs for Brown from 1978 onwards. And every detail, this is one of them, was finessed to make them efficient, elegant, and appropriate. The color coding, the typography, the feel of the plastic, even the curvature on the buttons. But none of that will be enough to save them because they do nothing to counter their functional shortcomings. Though the brown calculator does live on in a way because the Apple design team admired it so much that they modeled the digital interface of the iPhone calculator on it, so it will survive in its digital guise because of their memories of the original. But there's one category of traditional objects that may survive for real, those whose desirability has a functional purpose, like the peacock's tail turned out to do for Darwin, and an example is the printed book. And I'm not just choosing this as an example because I happen to love it, as I'll explain. The practical arguments against its survival are as compelling as those against the printed newspaper. E-books and apps beat printed books on convenience, choice, connectivity, and sustainability. And that's why I now download a lot of them. But I still buy printed books, and not just because of my long-lasting love for them and my lovely memories of reading them. It's because the printed book has a powerful advantage over its electrical and digital equivalents, providing it's as intelligently designed as this one, Ways of Seeing, by John Berger, who of course spoke at the marathon last night. He wrote the book in 1972, and it was designed by a wonderful graphic designer who's going to be speaking here at seven o'clock this evening, Richard Hollis, who is a long-standing collaborator and great friend of Berger's. Hollis laid out the pages of the book actually sitting beside Berger and consulted him about every design decision because he was absolutely determined to ensure that for a book about visual theory like this, the images were in exactly the right place. And Berger even trimmed the text, if necessary, to stop photographs going over two pages, for example. You don't have to know any of that to realize that when you're reading that book, it's really something special because it's designed is so lucid that it enhances your understanding of what Berger wrote. You get more from ways of seeing by reading it in this printed format than you would in any other. And it's a fabulous example of utilitarian design, which has the clarity and nobility of a well-made tool. The graphic designer Saul Bass once described the role of film titles as a way of conditioning the audience so that when the film began, they'd have an emotional resonance with it. And if the design of a printed book does the same as Hollis's Ways of Seeing does, it will continue to generate new memories rather than being enshrined in old ones. And the same applies to any other traditional object whose design is of such quality and whose function can accommodate and benefit from emotional resonance. Not, of course, that there's any reason why the designers of the digital equivalents of old-fashioned objects should not make them equally alluring and evocative. The memories they foster will be just as rich, but very different because they'll have been forged by different associations, meanings, contexts, and media, just as they should be. Thank you.